see you. And if I may kick off, uh, I would like to start by saying that on behalf of the America Europe Fund and uh, its youth forum, the chairman, which is Matthias van Heeren, who is sitting there, welcome to all of you, both the audience and the members of the panel tonight. I will try to guide you through this evening and uh, starting by saying that those among you who have traveled to the United States or maybe even live there, uh, they're probably familiar with uh, the US electoral cycle. Electoral cycles remind me often of throwing uh, a returning boomerang you throw it, um, you forget about it, and then suddenly uh, it is back. Uh, and that happens also with electoral cycles, cycles especially in the United States. As a, by way of recap, um, for those less familiar with the situation in the United States, so currently there is a, in the White House a president uh, who is a Democrat in the House since the last midterm elections, there is a majority of Republicans. And in the Senate, there is a very, very tight majority in favor of the Democratic Party. In November next year, 2024, all this might change or not. And of course, uh, the US election still has many lives to go before we arrive at the date of uh, of the, uh, at election date uh, in November next year. But everywhere the debate has started and uh, we also wanted you, mainly the students here at KU Leuven, also to benefit from initial insights and information on this ongoing debate. So let me introduce um, uh, our invited guests and I will do it in the order I will call upon them later in the debate on the different teams. Uh, first of all, on my left, your right, there's Bert de Vrouw, uh, who for us uh, Belgians is a well-known voice and also face on Belgian radio and television on uh, uh, current affairs and um, also an expert on American politics, I mean, to illustrate this point, in uh, 2020, the last presidential election, I remember, Bert, that you were um, mastering the famous, the very famous notice boards in TV uh, studio uh, with the incoming uh, election re results per state, and it's not an easy exercise. I've done it once in my life, and I think I failed, but you uh, brilliantly uh, succeeded. It was very impressive. On my right, uh, Stephen Defour, um, I would say a passionate uh, journalist and observer, a commentator of the United States, uh, writing high uh, quality articles in a nationwide newspaper, which is called The Standard in Belgium, and also has published books. And I'm authorized to uh, say tonight that he's writing a new book on the uh, GOP, the Grand Old Party, so the Republican Party is working on that one. Now, on my far right, uh, Professor Jean-Christophe de Frenje, who very kindly, very kindly uh, accepted to step in after uh, Bart Keremans, professor in American politics at this university, uh, this afternoon um, was called in sick, and he apologizes to all of you. But Professor De Frenje, um, uh, we, we owe him something. Uh, he's a professor in uh, economics uh, at uh, uh, Louvain-la-Neuve, uh, but also here at KU Leuven, uh, where he's giving uh, a course on the economics of the European Union, uh, the economics of the United States, and you're also making a link, I think, to, uh, to ch China and what's happening in Asia. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for accepting the invitation. And uh, thank you for, uh, I'm pretty confident, uh, providing uh, to our audience insights, which they normally 
uh, do not get in classes here at university or learn in books. Maybe one disclaimer, by way, still by way of introduction. I mean, you can see it. I mean, from the left to the far right, it's very much a male thing. Um, I don't apologize because we invited, uh, we approached four or five female journalists, among them also of American newspapers based in, uh, in Belgium. But unfortunately, they declined. Uh, we are living still in a free country, so uh, we decided to go, go ahead. But it is what it is. Now, the scenario for tonight and the rules of the game are as follows. I will start throwing some questions at the distinguished members of this panel tonight. And then maybe I will invite Matthias also to show some background slides depending on the team we are approaching. And we have five teams uh, that I would like within the time available address, which the first is the uh, interim elections that took place this year, 2023. The second team is the presidential elections 2024. Uh, then uh, I would like also to uh, throw some questions on the development within the two main parties in the US, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, I think we should address the importance of these uh, elections next year for the rest of the world, and in particular the transatlantic uh, community. And then uh, I hope we can uh, still uh, have address the theme of the importance of this election for American uh, democracy. Um, so uh, please prepare your own questions for the Q&A. Uh, and uh, we will conclude the evening uh, with beer and food in the downstairs, downstairs hall of this building. So if you're all ready, brace yourselves, because here we go. And let's start with the, the first team. And maybe, Matthias, if you can have uh, a slide on the interim results, uh, or the results, sorry, the final results on the interim elections of 2023, because I will invite, uh, starting with Bert uh, de Vrouw, if he agrees, and then, lay, and then afterwards with Stephen de Vrouw to ask some questions. And the main question is, I think, with these elections, is to know or to explain what happened exactly this year, and then uh, if the, we can already uh, learn something from what happened during these interim elections. And uh, Matthias, if I may go over the slides. So I start by, the first slide is on Virginia, the state uh, senate uh, and the House of Delegates were for the both uh, branches of the House, the, uh, the Democrats uh, achieved a majority. So next slide, uh, because there were elections of different races. So in Kentucky, a uh, conservative state, I would say, uh, there was a governor election and the incumbent, Andy Bashir, uh, he uh, won these elections, but I think he increased the percentage of uh, his vote compared to the last time, uh, Matthias, the next slide is on the governorship in Mississippi, where it was the incumbent Republican uh, who won the election. Matthias, next slide. And then uh, this was a, a referendum in Ohio uh, on abortion, which was um, won by, uh, well, there was a yes, overwhelming yes for 56% which confirms also earlier, at other times, uh, results of referendums on, uh, in other states, including conservative states, on the question of abortion, and, uh, which is a, a theme that has been prominent uh, also in, um, in the Ohio uh, referendum, but is becoming more prominent, is coming back as an important team, at least at the level of the states. So, Bert, with that, can we maybe kick off and have your comments on the question what we may have learned on these very partial uh, elections, also called interim elections 2000? Okay, you, you go. Yeah, thank you, Dirk. Um, well, I think what you could say is that perhaps 
President Biden, Joe Biden, is less popular than the ideas that he represents, than the ideology that he represents right now, this moment in time. Because what those results are showing is that even in pretty conservative states like Kentucky or Ohio, it is possible for Democrats to win elections, which is something remarkable in itself already in the, the, the current climate of polarized politics in the US. Um, and it, it, it should be a matter of um, consideration for Joe Biden and the Biden administration uh, going into the elections of next year. Um, I think that's, that's, it's reassuring for, especially if you look at abortion and, and, and many people think that abortion might be one issue that Democrats can try to win over um, um, voters next year, also in the presidential elections and in other, uh, all kinds of other elections as well, because it also plays on the local level, on the state level, but also for the presidential elections. Uh, if you see what happened in Ohio, where voters decided not to ban abortion altogether, to make room for uh, abortion to a certain extent, I think that's pretty meaningful for the Democratic Party and also for the Republican Party. They should take note of it. So I think that's important, but it also means that, and I think that's, that's already perhaps the core of the questions that we're going to uh, talk about tonight, it also means that there are some questions about Joe Biden and about um, his ability to win the elections next year, because if you look at his approval ratings right now, they're not very reassuring for him, uh, even with um, uh, an opponent, prob probable opponent like Donald Trump. It's not decided yet, and we're gonna talk about that also. But I think that's the, m the major lesson perhaps to learn from the elections of uh, beginning of November of this year. Uh, Thank you very much. Can we maybe... Stephen and possibly also uh, Jean-Christophe, um, pause a moment on this, um, this question of uh, abortion, because um, uh, in, in both in uh, Virginia and Kentucky, and also in Kentucky, uh, it became clear, I think, that um, uh, the democratic arguments uh, related to abortion uh, won the day and um, and the um, but also as I said in earlier elections in other states Kansas Montana Kentucky Michigan and but then also in the more liberal states Vermont and uh, California with rather high percentages each time there was the question was asked to the electorate and to the citizens uh, the outcome went only in one direction. Uh, so uh, that may be easier. So maybe, Stephen, would you care to comment on the uh, almost return of this question of abortion in, in, in the current cycle? Yeah. Well, a, a, a couple of interesting things about abortion as a political theme is that... Um, sorry. Did you get that? First part, okay. Um, so a, a couple of interesting things about it is that uh, for us nowadays, and certainly for young people like uh, most of you are, is that you would get uh, the idea that uh, being in favor or against uh, abortion, pro-life or pro-choice, as the Americans call it, that has been a, um, a, a major uh, issue uh, uh, determining your political choice uh, forever. Well, it hasn't uh, until way in the 80s, I would always say 90s, it wasn't a political issue at all. Uh, actually, Ronald Reagan in, in, in the 60s, even Barry Goldwater, the infamous, uh, very, very right-wing uh, Republican candidate in, uh, in 1966, uh, they were in favor of abortion rights, and uh, for instance, on the other hand, Al Gore, uh, who just just didn't make it to become uh, president for the Democrats, was very much against it. So it was m much more a matter of religion and 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 and, and, and cultural uh, personal uh, issues than of politics. So in uh, for all 
kinds of electoral reasons, uh, the Republican Party has uh, kind of uh, adopted the issue as, as, as a way of attracting voters. But after half a century, after the famous uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, decision, uh, Roe v. Wade, half a century of legal abortion in, in, in the United States, people have got used to it. And so uh, I would say, well, it's not just a guess. It, 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 65% of, of U.S. Uh, citizens are in favor of uh, abortion, period. And even more, around 80% are in favor of the right of uh, abortion in, in, in certain circumstances. Uh, what I'm trying to tell is that what the Republican Party, what, what the, the Republican Party candidates uh, today, today for the president, uh, presidential election and also the people in Congress are proposing, uh, which is very much a race to be the toughest on abortion possible, is not exactly concurring with what most of the American people want. So why do they do, do it? Because everything is in the American election system very much about winning uh, the, the, um, the, the, the primaries, becoming the candidate of your party, and so being much more harsh on the issues than being the toughest of your party. Which is the reason why why we always think oh uh, how how did the United States turn so much against abortion it it actually hasn't uh, which makes it a very tough issue to sell for Republicans because they're trying their best to be tougher than their their competitors uh, during the the primaries but whenever the uh, the issue comes up nationally in a national election it turns against them. And that is something that has been pretty clear in uh, in Ohio, for instance, uh, very much a swing state, if it's still a swing state and not a Republican state, and still people turn out to 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 be very much in favor of that right of abortion, so it could become in, in, in important uh, next uh, next year. Uh, and I think the Democrats consider themselves very lucky to have such a cultural issue that is considered by the voters very important because there are a lot of other cultural issues where they're not feeling that strong at the moment. Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, thank you, Stephen, it makes clear that probably up to now, on the basis of these um, interim elections, it's probably fair to say that uh, this issue is a theme on which the Republicans can be on the disadvantage, at Clearly. least at the state level. Clearly, yeah. Well, let's see Clearly. what it becomes then at the federal level if it has the same impact as an, uh, as an issue. But John Christophe, please, you would like to add something. Yes, I think what you see in a vote like that is probably a lot of mobilization by women and feminists to defend their rights. My question is, is this electorate will mobilize for Joe Biden in the presidential election? Mm -hmm. Because we know that last time, you know, uh, Trump was elected. He was actually elected with 21% of American age of voting. Because you have a 50% abstention rate usually since the 1980s in the United States. It lowered a bit during the first Obama election because of the black uh, electorate mobilization. But even at the second re-election of Obama, abstention raised again. So the problem is that will Joe Biden be able to mobilize on a general platform uh, as many Americans as Trump? Because Trump has a much more determined electorate for me. They are a minority of the American population, but they are very much determined, organized sometimes by religious organization. And so I think they will make the commitment to go to vote. While we see that a lot of the electorate of, of Biden, it looks far less convinced to go and voting for Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. So I agree with the comment of Stephen on uh, the fact that, yes, the, the reactionary position really pro-life of very religious organization is a minority probably in the American society, but they're very mobilized. And so we don't know what it's going to give. For me, I don't see... Biden as a personality strong enough to mobilize as much as Trump. Yeah. Thank you also for that comment. I, I think we can move to the uh, next year election, the presidential one, and also the elections for the 
for the House and, of course, also at the state level because it's not just the president. But let's focus on these presidential elections. And uh, if I can invite uh, maybe Stephen and, and then uh, Bert also in that order to first describe us the process as factually as possible leading to the two conventions and then maybe tell us what could still happen on this trajectory to the two conventions. I think that would be interesting for all of us to, um, and, and then we will move to the uh, uh, to the question of the younger voters and the age question of, the, of at least two potential candidates. But Stephen, if, if that's agreeable? Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, the thing is generally in an election year, um, you have a set agenda that uh, most of you will probably know about, uh, which means that um, starting in January uh, and ending around uh, sure. June, uh, there is the entire uh, system of uh, primaries and caucuses where in 50 states uh, there is an, 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 an election for both parties to, to, to decide uh, who the people from that party in that state want to be their candidate, uh, which uh, eventually leads to an, an, an adding of, of the the, uh, the 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 number of people uh, you uh, you manage to uh, to gather and 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 all added up leads to the national convention uh, in this year in July for the Republicans and in August for uh, for uh, the Democrats and then afterwards between the summer months and uh, and November you have the actually general election between. The candidates of the two uh, major parties uh, and and possibly uh, other candidates as well uh, independent ones or uh, third party candidates um, so that's the normal way to do it uh, and obviously obviously we won't have a uh, normal year this time um, on the one hand you could say that it's far far more easy than uh, at other times because uh, as we stand, uh, and it's very hard to predict what, uh, what, what, what could happen, but as we stand, it's, it looks pretty clear that Joe Biden for the Democrats and, uh, and Donald Trump for the Republicans will uh, be the candidates uh, uh, because they, uh, they both, well, Biden doesn't have much competition and um, uh, Trump nominally has, but he has a lead in the polls where he's uh, at uh, between 60 and 65 percent, whereas his main competitors, uh, Ronda Sanders and Nikki Haley, are around 14 or 15 percent. Uh, so it looks all as if you you, you wouldn't you, you have to go through the motions, obviously, but you don't really need those. Uh, the, the, those primaries and caucuses in half a year of all the voting and the stuff going on. But obviously there are two things that uh, uh, could uh, totally uh, turn events on his head. Uh, that is first on the Democrat side and also on the Republican side, but we're talking mainly about the Democrat side. I mean, let's face it, both of them aren't exactly uh, young people anymore. Uh, but certainly Joe Biden, uh, 81, and looking his age, uh, is uh, is someone where uh, yeah there there are quips about uh, what what happens until now for me personally I've always found that uh, let's say the the the, the right wing brouhaha about every time every time he uh, he doesn't know uh, from which uh, way to leave a stage or, or where he uh, mispronounces a name or something. Is is much overstated. Uh, I mean, he he, he seems uh, perfectly uh, 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 clear uh, in, in in his mind and in everything he says uh, to to be running the country. But what if uh, something worse than that? I'm thinking about, for instance, what happened to uh, uh, Republican Senator uh, Leader Mitch McConnell happened. If something like that would happen, maybe. That could still cause an upset for the for the Democrats. And on the other side, other side, obviously, there is Donald Trump, who uh, should be campaigning, but who is going to be in uh, either uh, civil law or criminal trials from now. He already is in one now, 
but from now until uh, well the, the rest of next year and probably even a couple of months uh, uh, in in the year after that. So uh, campaigning, I'm, I'm I suppose for Trump will be um, commenting at the. Uh, uh, on the on the steps of, of 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 tribunals where he has to come to testify, uh, there will be time for other things like rallies, but it it will be unusual, and the effect that it's going to have on public mm. opinion is obviously a a big big question at the moment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What can still happen? Well, let's have a look at the primary the primaries because it's going state by state, state after state, so it takes a few months, it takes uh, from starting 15th of January in Iowa. It's a caucus, it's a different kind of uh, primary, but that doesn't matter too much now. And it, uh, the last state is somewhere in the beginning of June. So what happens is uh, you have within the primary for uh, the Republican Party, you have several candidates, I think there are still seven or eight or something, um, that are trying to get, trying to win in every state, which means trying to get most of the votes, because uh, it gives you delegates, and it's a very complicated system, and it differs from state to state. Every state has its own rule, own rules, more or less. There are also some party rules, but it comes down to you try to win as many states as possible. And then you get delegates, and many of the delegates, they will go to the convention that Stephen was referring to in the summer, and then they will have to, they will be required to vote for the one, the candidate that you are representing. But there, it might also already become complicated because you have pledged delegates that are in theory, required to do so, and you have unpledged delegates that can still change their mind. So you already see all the, the eventualities, the possibilities that might occur. But okay, let's look. Let's have a look at the candidates. Are you aware, more or less, of the candidates? Do if I say Nikki Haley, do you know Nikki Haley? Many of you don't. Don't worry. Many Americans, I'm sure, <laughs> don't know the name either. Because it's still too early. We're still November. And it's only starting in Iowa in January. And many Americans don't pay attention so far. They don't pay attention at all. And perhaps they will not even pay attention um, as long as the primary is not taking place in the state where they are living. And even <laughs> then, if they are not affiliated with the Republican Party, they may not pay attention. And even if they are, they may not pay attention. You're not required to go and vote, even if you're uh, registered as a Republican voter. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is, as Stephen was telling you, Donald Trump, that's right, he has a, a big lead, uh, a difference of more than 20, 30 percent compared to the other candidates. But what's important during those primaries, because it's one state after another, it's the dynamics and its perception. Everybody expects Donald Trump to win the first primary, and it will probably happen. It's going to be Iowa. It would be very surprising if he didn't win. But let's suppose that there is a candidate who's performing much better than anticipated. Oh, that's a surprise. That's something interesting. And sponsors are, star are starting to pay attention. Sponsors, the, 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 the ones the big businessmen and, and Republican sponsors that are paying for the campaigns of candidates, that are looking for candidates that they see something interesting in. Mm. And so they start opening their wallet and paying for the campaigns. So now let's suppose you know that the, the main rival challenger of Donald Trump in the primary is Ron DeSantis. He's viewed to be the main challenger. He's the governor of Florida. But he's a bit, I think he looks too much like a, a wannabe Trump. Uh, he, he, is too, he has too many things in common with Trump in, in, in terms of ideas and even style. And, but he's not a Trump. He's not a real thing. So I don't think, and he's, you can already see that he's losing compared to where he started from. Um, 
I'm not sure if he's going to be the one that if there is going to be someone who can really challenge during the primaries, who can challenge Trump, I don't think it's going to be DeSantis, but I'm not sure. I may be mistaken. But let's suppose that Nikki Haley, who is now running third in the polls, that she is really performing surprisingly well in the first two, three primaries. Then you get an, another kind of dynamics because even ending second with a, with a good result can be very convincing for sponsors who don't want to support Trump and who are looking for an alternative for Trump in the Republican Party. I'm not sure, but I do think that it's not unlikely, let me put it that way, I'm not going to say it's likely, but it's not unlikely that we're going to see a dynamic during the first months of next year where you will see that there is suddenly someone emerging as an alternative for Trump within the Republican Party. Because, let's face it, what's the use of having a president, even if Trump would be elected, uh, who might be convicted and who might be even sent to jail before the election day or after the election day? In theory, it's possible. We can perhaps come back to that. I think that among leading Republicans in Congress and, and on state level, there may be some second thinking about Donald Trump. Okay, perhaps many Republicans think he's our best chance to beat Biden, and we do want a Republican president again. But I also think that there are many Republicans, but because not, but, but I think Stephen is... Uh, uh, in a better position to talk about that perhaps later. I don't think that the Republican Party, even if it has been hijacked by the Trumpists, I do think that there are still Republicans who would like to see another kind of Republican Party again. That grand old party isn't the grand old party anymore for many Republicans since it has been hijacked by Trump. So you were asking what might happen. I think it's going to be interesting to see if there's going to be any competition for Trump at all, how many delegates every of the candidates will gather, take with him or her to the convention. And if it's close at the convention, it's not even impossible to think that even within that, how many days, Stephen, five, six days of the convention, there may, may be another dynamic Let's suppose that Trump is close to a conviction in one of the four, five, six trials that he has to face, that there will be another dynamic where even at the convention, there will be a change in the position. It has never happened, but the 6th of January, you know, 2020, the storming of the Capitol had never happened either. We're really in uncharted waters since a uh, few years now in the United States. So it's one dynamic that we might see happening. It's true that right now it seems as if Donald Trump is going to crush all his rivals, his challengers, uh, but it's something that might happen. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have uh, on the question something what could still happen? We have this idea of momentum possibly in favor of a candidate who is at, at this moment not in the first place, but who might come closer. And then you have the answer of health, something on the health or something might happen to one of the candidates. And then all the indictments, the uh, impact of the indictments. So can, can I add yeah, just one, one thing about what, what Vert just said about momentum um there, there is there is one thing that makes me although i i'd like to see it happen it would be uh, it would be much more sane elections if uh, republicans would have another candidate than donald trump but there there is one thing that happened uh four years ago that really makes me hesitant to to, to believe whether a, a lesser known candidate could create this kind of momentum. And that's because of what happened four years ago with the Democrats. 
Uh, all the people who are very much involved in, in, in politics, the journalists, the, 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 the people involved with politics itself, they have been covering these very tight uh, democratic uh, primaries and, and, and caucuses. And everybody was talking about people like Pete Buttigieg, who won in Iowa, the very first one, and, 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 uh, and uh, Bernie Sanders and, uh, and Elizabeth Warren. And, and Joe Biden was so much considered to be the has-been, and he only finished fifth, I believe, in, in, in New Hampshire. And then uh, they moved for the third uh, election to South Carolina, and suddenly the has-been was totally on top of everyone again. And everybody has been saying, why, why, why was this possible? Did it have uh, something to do with race, for instance, because South, South Carolina has a lot of Afro-Americans among the Democratic voters, uh, and Biden, after all, was the vice president of Obama. All very much possible. But probably the main reason was that because Iowa and New Hampshire are always the first two uh, uh, caucuses and, and, and primaries, that also makes people there very much involved uh, in, in, in politics, out of pride of being the first ones, and which turns that into totally different elections from the other ones. Uh, and then from South Carolina on, suddenly it became very clear that People in the United States don't follow all the political mongo jungo uh, that much. And so they said, huh, Pete who? Pete Booty? Uh, I can't even pronounce his name, uh, let alone uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren. A lot of people just went like, uh, oh yeah, Biden, we know Biden. And so certainly here, and I actually even think that's that's one of the reasons why, why we're going to have elections between the old guys again, they're not just old and very well known. They also have been president, both of them. So they have this general, uh, I wouldn't say popularity because they're both hugely un unpopular, but, but they, they, are, they have an enormous uh, reconnection uh, advantage to, to, towards all the other ones. And uh, that didn't used to be the case. People used to follow uh, uh, politics much more. But nowadays, it makes it much more mm. difficult for any challenger to overcome the the, the much more famous faces. Okay. John Christophe. Uh, I think it has become really difficult to predict because there is one thing that we see not only in the United States, but in Europe or in Latin America is, uh, I would say, a lack of politicization of a large part of the population, which creates a very high volatility of the electorate. Nobody predicted Trump. Nobody predicted Boris Johnson. Nobody predicted Millet in Argentina, Bolsonaro, or, uh, you know, or, or the Fratri d'Italia in Italia. I mean, uh, if you look at electoral shift, I think it reflects a general disillusion of a large share of the population in Western society about the political establishment. And Trump played on that, Millet played on that, Bolsonaro is playing on that. And you don't know actually how they're selected, because I think it's partly irrational. I think that suddenly Trump, but uh, for me that makes it extremely difficult to understand because suddenly you have a big rise of far-right, extreme-right populism, and then it goes back. And this is for me, a lot of people have a very low level of knowledge of politics today, far less than 20 or 30 years ago in America, but also in Europe or in Latin America. Yeah. Now, ignorance is a, is a factor, but uh, I mean, it doesn't apply, of course, to our uh, audience and uh, students in particular. May I? If you, with your agreement, uh, move to uh, uh, something else, it's clear that, uh, and you will have understood that, uh, for the last months, but probably the six months, there has been a kind of frozen uh, situation whereby um, uh, a former president and an incumbent president are most likely uh, becoming the two candidates for the final uh, runoff, at least as we speak at the moment. Uh, so, um, if I may throw in a definition of statistics, uh, Jean-Christophe, uh, I once heard it was a poet, an Italian poet, who said statistics is the science that tell you that uh, if you eat four chickens and I eat none, 
we both have eaten two chickens. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so the average age of the these two candidates we were talking about is 80 statistically. Uh, so uh, I'm asking myself, and I'm asking maybe you uh, at the Q and A, but uh, first to the members of the panel, uh, what does that mean for the younger voters, which will become an increasing portion of the total electorate? Compared, also compared to last elections, but what does it mean for the younger voters in the United States? And uh, this um, potentially runoff between an incumbent president and a former president, and then I'm turning, I will turn to Jean Christophe. Uh, I would like to um, understand better for our students um, uh, what the difference is in economics approach, economic policy approach between the two of them, because it's the economic stupid uh, <laughs> that, uh, will, of course, will also be kind of bad. So, but for the younger voters, and maybe we can uh, show a slide on the elections, uh, the, the electoral results of last time, uh, Matthias, yeah. Uh, so uh, what does it mean? What does it mean? Uh, anyone uh, feel... Um, um, yeah, maybe Beth, you can start. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I don't think it's just a matter of um, age as such. It, it's also a matter, of course, for Joe Biden. It's a matter also about how he looks. He looks frail. Let's face it, he looks frail. He looks. He, he yeah, that's right. He's not. He's not. Doesn't seem to move as fluently anymore. And. But that's not the only thing. I'm pretty sure that I reported on the, the elections in 2016 in the state of Florida, where Hillary Clinton lost uh, of Donald Trump. It was also a very important uh, uh, swing state or battle state. And I spent a few days there talking, reporting on the election campaign. And my impression, I'm, I'm pretty sure I wasn't, I wasn't the only one to come to that conclusion that Hillary Clinton lost Florida because she lost the younger voters. She lost the, the more leftist voters of the Democratic Party in, in Florida, and she lost the younger voters. And people, just like with Brexit, they didn't think it was necessary for them to go and vote because they, nobody was really <laughs> thinking that Donald Trump was able to win the election, so they didn't mind about voting. They didn't go to the polling station and they didn't vote, but they didn't want to vote for Hillary, not because of her age, but because of what she represented in the eyes of the younger voters, the younger electorate. She was part of an older establishment. She, she was a Democrat, okay, but she was really viewed as a part of the older and then specifically, more specifically connected to the Clinton White House, but the old establishment and they didn't want to they didn't want to give her their votes. They also thought it wasn't necessary. That was the difference with 2020. They knew it was necessary to go and vote if you didn't want Trump to have uh, president yeah. again. Uh, so that's, and, but I think this feeling of we have to go and vote for Biden because we don't want Trump anymore, I don't think it plays out in the same way in the same degree as it did in 2020. So there is a risk that Biden will lose younger voters in many states. And of course, they're not going to vote for Trump, but it's, it's enough for Biden to lose elections in a particular state if uh, a big segment of his electorate doesn't want to vote for him anymore. Because it's all a matter of turnout, mobilizing voters. And if Trump is able to mobilize more voters than you are, then you win. Even if, if people would be required to vote, the majority would probably vote for Biden, very well possible, but if they don't vote, then it doesn't matter for Biden. You, you know what I mean. Um, so I do think that there is a problem. It's not just age, it's not just the way he looks fragile and frail, and, but also it's, it's part of it. But it's also because he's really, I mean, he's in politics for 40 years, uh, even longer, 50 even years. Longer, yeah. uh, he, he became the youngest senator in the history of the United States. You have to be 30 
to become a senator uh, in the federal Senate. Uh, he was 29 when he was elected, I believe. Uh, he started when he was 30. Um, but um, yeah, it was yesterday's birthday, so the, the elections are always yeah. beginning of November. He was 29 then, and he started as a senator in January, so 30. Uh, so he's, he's, he's a political animal, but he's also viewed as part of a, of, of a political establishment that many younger voters, my impression, don't feel particularly connected with anymore. And so that, that might be to his disadvantage. Definitely. Thank you. Maybe um, just a thought. Uh, can I turn on first time to the audience? I mean, are there any uh, young, well, of course, there are a lot of, you're all young, but uh, uh, <coughs> students uh, who are here in Leuven of American nationality and, and were authorized, you, you are allowed to vote. So, how many? Raise your fingers. Oh, so, you're several. So maybe we can ask you, I mean, how do you feel about the fact that on each side of the political spectrum there, is, um, there are candidates that, are, uh, that have a certain age? I mean, how do you feel? I mean, have you heard of the concept of double haters? You hate, you hate the fact that there are two <laughs> candidates that are... Uh, with a, who, who would like to respond? Maybe you, you, you would like, yeah. Eva, please. So when I'm talking to my friends at home about the upcoming decision that we're going to have to make, it's usually pretty common that, that we're all in agreement that there is not a great choice here, and yet the choice is so easy, um, which says a lot, right? Like, if you want the rule of law um, to to continue in the United States. I mean, there are just serious, serious concerns about liberal democracy in the US. Um, but these are conversations that I'm having with my friends who study politics. I'm from the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, which has the largest population of Arab Americans in, in the US. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if Biden can win Michigan now. I really, I mean, Detroit, Dearborn has a huge, huge mobilized voting base, almost always, I mean, always for Democrats. And the, a really common thing that I've been seeing, especially just through social media, because I'm not there right now, is that my really further left friends are saying never Biden, ever. Mm -hmm. Because they won't vote for someone who's, who they, who's supporting, supporting genocide. So that's something that I'm really concerned about with young voters is for the first time there's a demographic that's quite pro-Palestine, which is mm -hmm. very, very new in the US. New. It's hard to even talk about it over there because you can get in really big trouble. Um, but now it's being talked about and it's energizing people. So I, I would say that yeah. divide, I'm noticing even more now is connected to the, the recent war. Yeah, no, thank you so much uh, for your, your comment, uh, very valuable. Now, anybody else on the question of age or on the themes that as younger people you think is uh, important to you and to your generation? Uh... Hi, so yeah, to kind of, <clears throat> I think as a young American voter, you're me personally, I feel absolutely frustrated with not just the presidential decision that we have to make, but with the entire American political structure because you look at the people who are, you know, in in Senate, in, in Congress, and maybe less so in Congress, but oftentimes the people who are leading the Senate, like, uh, it's, it's pretty up there in age. And there's this general consensus that we, feel like the whole political system is out of touch with us and at least for me and my friends mm -hmm. and out of touch with sort of the issues that are important to us, um, or at least some of the issues anyway. And I actually really do agree that right now the whole situation in Palestine is going to potentially have a very negative effect for the sort of democratic establishment because a lot of young voters are so, um, 
by and large tend to be much more pro-Palestine than the democratic the people of the democratic establishment. So it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. And I am generally concerned that this situation will lead to significant losses for the Democratic Party, which on one hand, like I kind of agree that the party probably does, you know, let's see, I agree that, you know, it's a big issue and that it's it's horrible what is happening over in, in Israel and Palestine at the moment, but also at the same time, you have to protect the rule of law in the country too, and so there's that that issue, and it, it'll be fascinating to see how it plays out, but also quite concerning, so. Maybe one more intervention if somebody wants, yes, in the back, and if I may say, while the, the mic is, uh, is, is, um, is going around, maybe on um, one specific question, uh, so Palestine is a growing issue, but it's not just in the United States. We were discussing before the thing that the number of communities around the world that is more pro-Palestine and wasn't present or didn't exist at the last conflicts in the Middle East, I mean, is something striking, not just in the United States, but also in many other countries. So it's probably a given. And my question also would be to the younger people, I mean, Climate, is that an issue? Climate that uh, concerns our American friends in the younger generation, please. Uh, yes, hello. So I would say that in my opinion, it doesn't always have to do with AIDS, but with the main policies and the mm. ideas that each candidate is promoting. For example, for me in 2020, I would much easily go for Bernie Sanders, who was I think older than Joe Biden, uh, than Joe Biden because of his political and economic views. So the way I see it right now personally, I don't know if I can even choose between the two of them, not because of their age, but because of policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, this is a big conversation, but I think on many important issues like inflation and the economy in general and foreign policy, there are not big enough differences, in my opinion, between many of the candidates. Well, in the last many years, but right now, too, I think that the, the problem is not AIDS. The problem is not AIDS. I mean, uh -huh. I specifically wouldn't choose for other reasons, but it's also really interesting to see how Joe Biden and many of the Democrats have changed their opinions on many issues like, let's say, abortion, because Joe Biden was against abortion for decades. And also, you know, war on drugs, war on terror, all that stuff doesn't help supporting what's going on right now with the genocide either. But mm. I feel that many young people will not decide only based on AIDS, but on economic policy, green transition, foreign policy, and all these issues. And if they don't see big enough differences, they won't vote you know, for the candidate that is a threat to the rule of law, but also we have to see the, how do you say it, how the Democratic Party and the underwhelming choices that it has presented, in my opinion, many times, have led to right-wing populism. So how the threat to the rule of law is created by not having other choices and people get radicalized towards the right Unfortunately, mm. yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Really highly appreciate it. But you mentioned in your uh, excellent uh, comment of inflation, uh, which allows me at least to turn to Jean Christophe and to ask him if, in his view, and as an expert on economics, both in Europe, uh, United States, Asia, what he sees as, um, let's say, uh, relevant differences in the convictions on the uh, development and the growth of the American economy between the two candidates we were speaking of. Thank you so much. I think actually the difference are in terms of economic policy are not so big. Mm -hmm. And uh, some journalists called uh, Biden Trump with a smile because he actually had very unilateralist policy in terms of trade policy. Uh, but he, Biden actually wanted to have support of allies. I think 
It, the problem is that the two candidates are constrained by the economic and social situation of America. I mean, first, you have long-term trend which have fragilized the political establishment in the US. I mean, uh, you had a transformation of the US economy. So you from Michigan, you said, you know, the city of Flint or Detroit, who lost more than half of their population because it used to be the industry belt. And now it's called the Rust Belt because you had relocation of industries to Mexico or to China. Uh, you had even more than relocation, robotization and automatization that destroyed most of the jobs in the US. And these industrial jobs were replaced by jobs in services which were often non-qualified and quite low labor, uh, with low labor uh, union participation. So, I mean, if we look at unions, for example, in America since the 1980s, you used to have 30% of unionized American. You have no 9% of American workers unionized. You used to have a corporation tax of 35%. Uh, Trump has reduced it to 21. Well, then Biden has moved it back to 28, but effectively it's far less than that because you have a lot of loophole. And we know that companies like Amazon or Apple or Microsoft have literally hundreds of billions on offshore bank account uh, using Ireland or other places to avoid the taxation. This has changed tremendously America. I mean, from the 50s to the 2000s, you had rising standards of living for the whole American population because you had productivity gains in the industry, thanks to Fordism and other technologies that created rising productivity and rising wages. But since the 1980s, there is a total gap between productivity and wages. That is, productivity continued to increase thanks to the digitalization of the economy, the automatization, but wages are not linked anymore to productivity. And in the 2000s, it became even worse because wages started actually to go down. The medium wage started to turn negative since the 2000s. And uh, at the same time, because of different economic policy, the welfare system in America became increasingly less generous. And it means that Americans have to pay more for education, more for health costs. And during the last two election campaigns, it's been a major concern. Uh, health costs are increasingly uh, high in America with a, a system of health insurance that costs a lot to American middle class voter. And so you are in a perception, but which is basically correct, that a lot of the working class and middle class are losing standards of living in America. Uh, and for the first time in 2019, that's before the COVID, between 2008 and 2019, you had actually a lowering of the life expectation, of the life expectancy. That's the first time in US history since the independence we have that. That is, we have a decline of expect life expectancy due mostly to bad health care and, of course, bad uh, junk food and the use of very cheap food in most of the poorest neighborhood of the America. So it means that today, between the lower you know, percentage of the US population and the 10 per the ten ten top percent, you have actually sometime a life expectancy difference of 10 years. So I think you have to look in this context, uh, which is also a context of more, you know, a feeling of decline about uh, from a majority of American. And at the same time, an external factor, the rise of emerging economies and mostly of China which have questioned the capacity of the US to be the global leader of the global economic governance in the 21st century. And especially after the 2008 crisis, it became increasingly worrying for the American public, but also for the economic elites. How can we resist the rise of this industrial policy that creates big Chinese firms like Lenovo, Huawei, uh, that we see the Chinese being more present in the WTO, in the WHO, in the IMF, 
uh, demanding a change in the global governance system. And I would say that created a very defensive approach. So the social economic background and the competition with China created in America, I would say, a rise of economic nationalism. And it started already with Obama, with a Buy American policy. And actually, if you look at Obama, he was also the one to stop reappointing judges at the WTO, which started to block the WTO process. Trump just accelerated the process and blocked the WTO. Now, Biden, in that sense, is not breaking away so much from Trump. He's still being compelled by some, I would say, economic elite, but also by a public opinion current, to remain quite protectionist. If you look at the, the kind of tariff imposed against the European, a lot of them are still there. Uh, you have still a position which is difficult for uh, the WTO reform, so for the moment, and I doubt that we're going to have much progress during this election on that. Uh, and clearly, I would say that even if we look at initiatives like the, uh, the, uh, framework, the economic framework for the Indo-Pacific, which is almost a very weak trade agreement because it's not really a trade agreement. It is, but it's a proposal to make some kind of economic, you know, let's say economic agreement with the Indo-Pacific area, but it was rejected by the party of, of Biden. So it's not going anywhere. The Americans under Biden have not been more free trade than Trump in many ways. And they are still very unilateral, unilateralist, I would say. You have a technological and trade Atlantic Council, Transatlantic Council, that was established by Biden. So Europeans were very optimistic and says, OK, well, here we have something different from Trump. But you know, uh, one of the think tanks in Brussels, the ACP, uh, European Center for International Political Economy, has qualified this as a talk shop. No? rather than something that really was creating result. And I think one thing that was very worrying for the van der Leyen Commission is that you had this council that was supposed to discuss technological cooperation. And then the Biden administration comes with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is seen as really unfair by the European Commission because by doing a lot of tax breaks and subsidies, it attracts the green technology industries of Europe to move to America, which has created a lot of tension between the van der Leyen Commission and the Biden administration. Precisely, Inflation Reduction Act should have been discussed in this council. So I think the Europeans were a bit disappointed in that sense with, with uh, Biden. I think that Biden maybe could do more, but the problem is that even if he would like to do more, his party is terrified of the populist, protectionist, current in the electorate. And as we've seen for the Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework, the rejection by the Democrat Party is that they think they're going to lose the election if they go for a free trade agreement. And so I think that, unfortunately, we are, even if Trump does not succeed uh, in 2024, we will still have a very protectionist and unilateralist America. Um, I don't know how Europe can convince that it's actually not be the best option for the United States. And there is a lot of, you know, if you look, for example, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, there is Beckstein, who has made a good book showing that America had to cooperate with Japan and Europe, especially if we wanted to contain China. But uh, it seems that for the moment, unilateralism seems to be the policy since the crisis of 2008. And uh, there is also something that I find very worrying, is that the economic disparities that I discussed earlier, the inequalities and the decline, are continuing. Which means that the fraction of people who are against the political establishment and who are ready to go for an extreme right, and some people could even say, fascist kind of politics are increasingly strong in the United States. I mean, uh, you have violent people. They took over the capital. 
this is something really significant. And I would be worried if Trump is elected and sent to jail, for example, what would be the reaction of a lot of extreme right groups that are armed in America? You cannot simply dismiss, oh, the state will you know, manage this. Well, for the capital, that was a bit different. And I think you have to look at the social economic condition and, of course, the rise of China that challenged the security of being the hegemonic power, because America is not anymore the only big player, that creates a sense of uneasiness and malaise in the American population. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jean-Christophe. Um, uh, I, I retain, among uh, other things, uh, you said that, in, in fact, on economic trade, industrial policy, the difference might be not that big, um, uh, maybe with the exception of new tariffs, of new tariffs, yeah. uh, new tariffs, which probably will be, um, well, I think Trump has already announced that uh, he will impose, in any case, new, new tariffs on them. If I can just add one thing, I mean, since the crisis of 2008 and especially the rise of China, you've seen a shift of paradigm in the American economic policy. Before the American policies were free trade with a sort of, you know, industrial policy in defense, like Ronald Reagan did in the 1980s with Star Wars. But what we've seen with Trump and Biden are unprecedented amount of direct industrial policy. You have the Innovation Act, the uh, Infrastructure Act, the Science and Chip Act, and then the Inflation Reduction Act, if we add them together, that's over $3 trillion. We've never seen, since the end of World War II, an American interventionist government. And the goal is clearly to keep a technological edge vis-à-vis -vis China. Yeah. So I think this is a big difference. And it is Trump and Biden policy together. It's bipartisan. Yeah. Both parties vote for that. Uh, I think that's absolutely through this uh this kind of uh, objective of repositioning, repositioning the United States in the economic and technology world of today. But I think as Europeans also we should uh, learn to appreciate that objective much more as a comprehensive uh, effort, uh, at least under the current administration. Now, can we move to the developments within the two parties? And um, uh, Stephen, uh, we revealed the scoop here. You're writing a new book on the Republican Party. Uh, can we start maybe by asking you to comment on this uh, recent, um, on the political significance of the recent ousting of the former Speaker of the House and, um, and the election of the new speakers? Uh, maybe uh, describe also to us the, the process of this uh, what you call the hijacking uh, of the uh, grand old party by a sort of right-wing sect by, by Trump himself. And is it still possible for the Republican Party to return uh, to its more uh, uh, traditional attitudes, let's say? So maybe you can start by addressing that kind of no, question. No, no, right no. Thank you. Well, um, we have been talking in the last decades, and certainly in the last decade, uh, quite a lot about the uh, extreme polarization of American politics. Uh, well, there are more, more parties than two, but in Congress there are only, only, only two. Uh, factually, we, we only have two parties, two real parties in the United States, and they are, have become vehemently uh, opposed to each other uh, more than um, ever before in the at least in the after uh, civil war era um the strange thing you see develop now recently is that the warfare is not anymore between the two parties but there is uh warfare from from all sides and uh, often in a very unpredictable unpredictable uh shifting way uh, within uh, the Republican Party, or at least within the uh, Republican fraction in, 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 in the, the House of Representatives. I have to say that uh, the Republicans in the Senate uh, 
behave uh, in a much more moderate way uh, for the moment. But what we have recently seen in the house is, is incredible. It's incredible because um, normally you would say, hey, there is huge polarization. Uh, my side thinks uh, black, your side uh, thinks uh, white. We are going to be sticking all together. Certainly if the uh, majority you have is, is, is flint or thin uh, like it is in, in, uh, in, in, in the House of Representatives. That's not clearly not what's happening. What has happened is that the most uh, far right part, uh, and I would say about 5%, <coughs> maximum 10% of the Republicans in the House have decided, have seen that because of this lack of a clear majority, that their votes matter and that they can, they can basically blackmail the entire uh, party uh, because if they, if they don't give their support either to anything that has been proposed or, or even to the, the majority of be, uh, becoming or remaining Speaker of the House, without their votes there is no majority anymore. So they can, they, they can have very harsh demands which is very easy, very uh, difficult to, to answer to, to from the establishment because then they would be considered uh, uh, way too extreme and uh, then the, the more moderate, uh, the people with a, a more moderate electorate risk uh, losing their seat. So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. So for weeks now we have seen that first the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, is, uh, was, was ousted then uh, several other ones tried, and always with a different set of, 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 of opposers, they, they didn't get to that majority. And in the end, they, they, they did. They now have uh, uh, Mike Johnson, who was a total unknown until very recently, who is pretty radical, pretty uh, extremely radical. I mean, he's radical uh, in, 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 in his beliefs, being a born-again Christian with, who, who actually... Uh, He's he's member of a society that promotes that that uh, our our world our our humanity started on the Ark of Noah where actually also the dinosaurs were on. Um, uh, but that's that's not the only thing. Another thing that in normal times would be more than enough to never accept him to become the Speaker of the House is that he was the architect of the opposition. Uh, on uh, January the 6th, 2020, uh, uh, of uh, confirming uh, Joe Biden as the elected president, which in itself would normally, I mean, would bar someone from holding office, I would say, let alone becoming Speaker of the House. But So, so you're now in a situation where, okay, uh, we have a Speaker now, but once again, his job safety isn't bigger as his predecessors because at any time uh, another bunch of 20 people who oppose anything that he has done might might hold that against them and he is going to lose his majority again so yeah and, and the democrats are standing by and watching this uh, some I, 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 I suppose uh, with a little bit of amusement because i do think that uh, republicans are shooting in their own foot uh, at least for those people who are, uh, are following uh, uh, Congress uh, politics uh, enough to, to, to see that, well, I mean, even if they have a majority, can't, can't they rule properly? Why should, why should we be voting for a party who doesn't make, it, it, it's not because of internal uh, in, infighting, not able to, to even use their majority? So that's a very, very, very uncommon uh, situation. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to see how they can ever get out of it. And that's because of what I said, I mentioned earlier, that let's say starting in, in the Nillies, uh, around the time uh, where the Tea Party became important, uh, you're too young to remember Sarah Palin, but uh, I, I, <laughs> a, lot of you, a lot of you do, where uh, being very, very right-wing, very, very... Uh, Populist, conservative, very, very uh, much into your Christianity has become uh, a much more important thing to be elected and, and to work on than anything else, which means kind of means that the GOP has left 
the ambition that there absolutely used to be in the older days. Uh, people like Newt Gingrich in the 90s, uh, very famous because of his polarizing tactics, but he really wanted, I don't say I necessarily agree with what he wanted, but he really wanted to have an influence on policy. And the idea that you uh, have, you are trying to get a majority either in Congress or in the presidency in order to use that majority to, 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 to build a nation the way you see it has somehow left the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Republican Party and has been uh, substituted by, by negativism and a sabotage politic. And it's very hard, and I've, I've, I've had the chance to talk to John McCain for six or seven minutes. Um, and that was at the end of his life. And John McCain, who used to be a, a presidential candidate in 2006, uh, uh, sorry, 2008, um, he was at the end of, uh, of, of his life and at the end of his time uh, in, in Washington. And he, he said, I, 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 I don't recall the exact words, but he was so incredibly disappointed and not uh, uh, holding back about this disappointment. Uh, where he said, well, why, why have I invested my life in this if I look at these, I didn't, he didn't say fools, but it was more or less what it came down to, around me who, who are just out of polarization and, 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 and fighting and not in not with the ambition of really changing things. And how do you get back from that? Very difficult, because because of the entire system that you have to find, you have to become the nominee for your party first in order to get to the actual uh, election. Well, the, the, the people who, are the, the, who, who paint themselves as the most radical ones are always the ones who uh, win uh, the, uh, the, 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 the primaries in uh, in their parties, which actually also plays on the other side, mm. because people like most famous one, people like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, or 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 the or the other people uh, uh, from let's say the the, well, the 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 very left side of the Democrat Party, there used to be less uh, of them as well, because it the the dynamics used to be more that you had to. To, to find common ground. And the entire idea of finding common ground is lost in American politics to, uh, today, a little bit on the Democrat side and very much on the, on the, on the Republican side. Mm. That, that's not uh, very encouraging news when you hear that uh, uh, members of, um, of the House um, seem I, I, to be- I just, I just wanted to huh? uh, say, I believe John McCain, I think it was it is genuine what you heard him saying. I just want to remind everybody that he he's the one who took Sarah Palin as his running mate. So <laughs> which, <laughs> that's also true. I think yeah. Dr. Probably Frankenstein. He, probably he has regretted it afterwards, but that's yeah. all I wanted to add. In any case, what I was going to say is that uh, well a member of any parliament in the, in the world probably has as a core job to kind of try to influence policy and as a core job to pass legislation of yeah, course, if, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you if you give up on 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 that core mission then uh, there is there's a problem on the democratic side uh, Bert, i don't know if i may ask you i mean we have already addressed the declining support i think of president biden uh, and the democratic party within certain minority groups uh, but there are also elections in uh, next year on uh, on, uh, on the House, any chance, if I may ask, to flip the House and to, to go from a Republican majority to a Democratic majority? There's also a chance that the Republicans will manage to flip the Senate. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it wouldn't make that much difference. Yeah. If, you, if you look at what, what's the problem, and we were talking about this um, problem of jobs, um, the jobs that were lost to China, so to say, or to Mexico, um, and then this, that this would be a kind of breeding ground for Trumpism or white, even white identity idea, ideology. And it's true, I agree with uh, what Professor de Vrenje says. But on the other hand, 
it's not because of China that there is inequality in the United States. It's not because of China that, I mean, it's, it's because of, it may be because of China that jobs were lost, yeah, but it's a matter of the American, organizing the American society uh, that makes the difference whether or not there is this big inequality. And I do think that the Democrats also have some responsibility in creating or letting um, or having this Trumpism, whatever you want to call it, develop. And not only the Democrats, it's the same for Europe European political situation, but we're talking about the US now. Because, and this may be a bit provocative perhaps, but I do think that there is far too much talk about identity politics in the US and about racial divisions and far, and there is not enough mm. analysis and discussion about class divisions and inequality. And you may even think that all the talking, also in the media, about racial issues, identity issues are blurring in a way the class divisions and the inequality and the, the fact that, for instance, so many Americans don't have any healthcare insurance or are underinsured, 60 million, 70 million Americans, depending on how you want to count them. Uh, the media hardly talk about that in America, but they talk, they do a lot of talking about, well, and, and for good reasons, of course. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be talking about Black Lives Matter and about racial discrimination, but sometimes racial discrimination goes together with class divisions or just the, the fact that the American society doesn't take care of all its citizens uh, in a way that it should do. Uh, and I do think that the Democrats have also been following a wrong strategy in that respect. It's true that the Democratic Party, the Democratic electorate, is a kind of collection of minority groups, and sometimes also the famous Obama coalition was considered to be not only a, a collection of mm -hmm. minority groups, but also of women and younger women. You know, the soccer moms, you remember that, that name? Uh, as a sociolo sociological category uh, that the pundits were talking about when there were election campaigns, elections going on. Um, but they have lost, the, the Democrats, I mean, they have lost the attention for the common American, regardless of what race he or she belongs to. Just the common American worker or employee, whatever, uh, everything is being considered now in, 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 in identity groups. And I think, so what's left for a white worker who has been working in Flint or uh, in um, a small town in Ohio where the steel factories have moved away to China or Mexico or wherever and who doesn't have a job anymore and he's blaming China for that. So what's left, and he's actually, that's right, uh, I don't know who was uh, telling, or giving this example, he, he sees Indian people arriving in the United States. They're very good in uh, programming, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and so they are earning more money than they are, and then they see the minorities, and they get some social support that they don't get, because they, their income is just above the level that the level that you should be in or under, I mean, to get some social support. So you get all these kinds of people comparing their situation with, with other groups and then they see, oh, it's always minorities that, that seem to get support that we don't get. So it's understandable that there is this uh, analysis of their situation in categories of, of being white or black, but it's also a matter of the way that the Democrats themselves are framing the problems that America is facing. It's not only about, of course, there is a lot of racism and racial injustice, but it's also a matter of how do you organize the economy, your social security system, social security, I mean, in European sense, social insurance system. Um, 
So I do think that the Democrats, and Joe Biden, let's, let's be fair, Joe Biden has moved a little bit back in that direction by supporting unions, for instance, uh, which Obama never did, I think, as far as I remember. Mm. Uh, not as explicitly as Joe Biden. But of course, Bernie Sanders that you were referring to, is, 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 he's the one who is really putting that on the agenda again and who was very successful apparently in doing so in 2016 when he was uh, competing with Hillary Clinton. Uh, so I do think that there is a difference and there is a responsibility also f uh, on the part of the Democratic Party. But I don't know if Stephen or uh, John Paul agree with what I'm saying. Uh, if I can just add something on that. Um, I think that if you recall, well, I think one of the reasons why Hillary Clinton lost was actually that she accepted three conferences paid by Goldman Sachs $100,000. And that made her, for the left of the Democrat Party, somebody too close to Wall Street. While actually Donald Trump was a billionaire, so actually some working class people were saying at least he doesn't need the money of Goldman Sachs, he has his own money. And oh, it might be absurd because when you look at Donald Trump in government, it actually used the state to support some of his business. But the fact is that some people said, this is not a Democrat candidate anymore, it's a Wall Street candidate. And I think that I totally agree with, with Bart on, on this. I think that the Democrat Party used to have a strong constituency in the union, and I would say the the black and white working class, uh, but no, it's it needs to actually demonstrate with the union just before the election. But I think it looks a bit desperate what Biden is doing with the union for the moment. It doesn't seem very genuine, and, and I would say that it's also a general trend. Europe is not that different. What do we have politically on what used to be the center left? In France, we have Macron. The new Labour, we have Matteo Renzi. Uh, if, if you know where the left was in the 1980s and the right, and what do we have in traditional parties that were conservative and liberal? Instead of having Les Républicains and Sarkozy or Chirac, we have no Marine Le Pen. The Conservative Party in Britain has become increasingly very close to the American you know, populist right-wing politics. Uh, not all the conservative parties, but if I look at Theresa May and Boris Johnson, you have to say that there are some similarities with Trump and Johnson. It's obvious they actually congratulated each other. Um, so I would say that even if you look in Japan and Shinzo Abe, I would say there is a change in the politics. Center-left have become free market, but without looking too much at the social question, and discussing more about genders or things like that. And the conservative parties have become increasingly populist <coughs> rather than traditional. And this is what we see in Italy, in France, in the UK, in soon in Germany, I'm afraid, and uh, in America. So I think it's, it's a way the global organization and globalization has actually created a much more polarized world. Hey, I'm, I'm looking at, um, at that. Thank you so much. But can I turn to, to you? Uh, okay. And, um, and uh, we may come back maybe through your questions to this issue. Um, can, can, can I just uh, Yeah, I mean, maybe quickly, we take okay. one, one or two questions and then we sure. can go okay. on. So any just... questions also on the impact? I don't know. Any, uh, please, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, the first is... With, uh, relating to what you said at the beginning from the first primary, uh, which is in Iowa and then uh, New Hampshire. Mm. And I was wondering why they chose to do, I mean, originally I think it was Oregon or something that started this, and then they switched to northern states, small states. Why couldn't it be like, I mean, I can understand, but I wanted to have your opinion on why couldn't it be, let's say, California or another southern st states, like how would it impact um, the whole election game if a south states would yeah. was the first one and a big states um, 
Yeah, that's yeah. my question. Yeah, why these states and why not another? Yeah, and what o effect would it have? In, in our Please, uh, second question. Um, there was this article out the end last week which talked about Nikki Haley, um, the Koch brothers, uh, or Koch brother, now uh, obviously known anti-Trumpist, has swung a fair amount of money behind her campaign, um, which was previously destined for DeSantis, it's been argued, and understandably the military-industrial complex, given her sympathies for overseas military uh, presence, are also quite fond of her. Um, for corporate America and big donors, and I could add big tobacco and potentially alcohol to that list too, um, for corporate America, is Nikki Haley the insurance policy? Should Trump be indicted? Or is she a genuine threat, potentially, in a scenario where, as, as you said, sir, she starts well and may proceed to go on, so to speak? Yeah, okay. okay, I think one more, and then we, uh, and then we uh, have a second round. So here the gentleman. Yeah, thank you very much. My question relates to being uh, analytical of the Republican Party, because I think that's pretty hard to do right now, because on one hand, we have an academia, especially a US academia, which is not only very polarized, but very often quite partisan as well. It, it really often equates uh, the Republican Party with corruption and then, you know, manifestation of evil. Uh, and that can be, you know, I'm not saying I disagree with that, but it does remove much of the analytical value. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, as discussed in a panel, we see that in the Republican Party, there is a genuine disappearance of, of standards, or dare I say, spine, with uh, supporting uh, Donald Trump after January 6th. Uh, having George Santos still be in the House. So this is genuinely very hard to understand where this has gone. So how does one be aware of all these trends happening within the Republican Party and still avoid being too partisan and remain analytical? Mm. Okay. So can we start answering maybe the first question? So on the, the order of states and the selection of states for the primaries, then maybe Nikki Haley, the first question. Uh, and then we have the last question on uh, the developments within, or the attitudes you have to take within the Republican Party. So who would like to start on the order of the states and the selection of states for the primaries? Yeah, I'd like to, although I, I don't have the exact answer. Uh, I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. sure exactly why they ever started with Iowa. Uh, um, uh, Unless the fact that uh, you're not going to uh, start with a, uh, a state that has a very, very clear either conservative or, uh, or liberal profile. Uh, same goes for New Hampshire. Certainly in New Hampshire, the fact that... Uh, are there any people from New Hampshire here by any chance? <laughs> because mm -hmm. um, because uh, it's, it's a breed apart. Um, uh, the people who are very, very uh, gung-ho about, about politics... Uh, um, and uh, uh, it's something where, where politics has always been alive much more than, than in the other states, which made it a good candidate to start with, uh, with from the beginning. Uh, so th those are mainly the reasons. And you can tell now very much because for the Democrats, they have shifted the order and uh, they are going to start now with <laughs> South Carolina. Remember that earlier on, I told you how, how uh, Biden did uh, very poorly uh, in Iowa mm. and New Hampshire and then suddenly surged mm. in, in South Carolina. <laughs> so, yeah, it's pretty clear why <laughs> they are moving things now in order to uh, not have any embarrassment to start with. But uh, there is a backlash because people in New Hampshire don't like this and uh, it, may, it may actually turn them against uh, Biden. And, and so in the Democrat primary there, people uh, could very well turn uh, just out of out of spite to to to, to one of the uh, the uh, Dean Phillips or, or, or Marianne Williamson uh, one of the uh, no chance uh, challengers but just because they they don't <laughs> like their 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 role uh, being, being being stolen from them okay Nikki Haley is she insurance policy for corporate America that was your question. Probably, um, I, I think. I think no. I think. I think corporate America can live with Donald Trump as well, uh, as long as it's not getting too much out of hand, um, as long as it's not getting too chaotic. 
in the United States because that's something that corporations don't like. I think they don't really like 6th of January uh, corporations in America. But uh, apart from that, they can be happy with Donald Trump as well. They were happy with Donald Trump during his uh, first term. But as I told you, I, I do think part of the Republican Party and corporate America, and we all know that they are related, but also with the Democratic Party, there are some good relations with corporations. Uh, I do think that uh, part of the party and part of the corporate America will be worried about Donald Trump getting elected um, during the course of the primaries, convention, and the trials and the convictions. Because, as I told you, he may be convicted, well, I, I think he will be convicted. He may pardon himself once elected for the federal cases, but not for the... If he's convicted in Georgia, he can't pardon him for that. So do you know the election case in Georgia? And nobody knows how it would turn out. He could be elected, even inaugurated, starts his second term in January 2025, and then the trial would end in Georgia, and he would be convicted. Also, he would appeal probably, but he would be convicted again. He should be arrested. Nobody knows what's going to happen. So, and with all that in mind, it's very well possible that uh, part of the Republican Party will start thinking again. Yeah. And Nikki Haley, I think, will be a very, they would be very happy with someone like Nikki Haley or someone else, I, I think. Yeah. Very difficult to define the preferences of uh, uh, the captains of industry in in a lot of countries. I mean, countries I know best. I mean, they would, they can be very flexible on uh, on their choices. But uh, there was the, 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 there was another question on, uh, as I understood it, uh, if I may, that uh, on the attitudes. I think it was more was also a bit of a comment you are making. The attitude um, you have to take within the Grand Old Party on the one hand from the point of view of the party politics, on the other hand from the more general interest point of view, the, uh, the bipartisan point of view, uh, if, I, if I understood you correctly. I mean, what's, what's the attitude you have to take? And, in, and you said it's very difficult. Uh, as, as opposed to the or Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very difficult. Can we come back to that question during our drinks? Because it deserves a drink, I think. <laughs> um, uh, and we go to the to the next question. Uh, I think Bart was there. So on that side, Matthias. Sorry. One, two. Wait, so. And then Thank you very much uh, for all your insights. Very interesting uh, debate. Also, I've lived in the United States for 14 years of my adult life. Uh, first time I was there it was Reaganomics. Um, I've seen many elections, many, many elections come and go. The one thing that people kept on asking me is, uh, how did it get to be so polarized, that entire system? And I wanted to get back to, your, to the system and the reasons and the state of democracy in the United States for, with, with my following question. The more I think about it, the one reason I always come back to is this two-year cycle of elections in the House. People are always indebted to interest groups. They're always busy trying to get funding for their next elections. They're never busy making policies or implementing policies. The solution in that sense, and I'm, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, in my eyes is therefore very simple to the state of democracy in the United States. Expand that two-year cycle to at least four years or maybe six like in the Senate and we would have a totally different political system, maybe less polarized, more room for third party candidates. I'd take any view uh, on any of your views on that. Yeah, I think your reference to the independent candidates, third party, yeah, that's, uh, we didn't cover that. Maybe we can say something about it. And that was the last uh, question. Yes. Um, <coughs> Yes, please. Uh, first of all, again, thank you for the debate. Um, as we discussed the insurance option of the Republican Party, I was also wondering regarding the Democratic Party and who could rise up 
in a possible post-Biden era. So you mentioned Pete Buttigieg, who I also have trouble pronouncing the name of, <laughs> possibly Gavin Newsom, although he might continue to focus on California. We might see a figure like Obama rise, how he did in the early 2000s, and then eventually rising to the Democratic candidacy. So my question relates to how do you see the Democratic Party evolve, particularly in a post-Biden era? Post-Biden era. Mm. No more questions? No. Oh, wait. So one, uh, oh, no. two, the two last ones, we take them together. Yes, please. Here, Matthias, here uh, in the second row. Um. Um, if you would still like to, I would request that Mr. Defour maybe makes the comments that he really wanted to make earlier, but he didn't get the chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah that, thank you. I promise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I got fear. Uh, it was going to happen anyhow. Anyway. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you. My question is about assuming if Trump is the candidate for the Republican Party. You mentioned that there are considerable aspects within the Republican Party that dislike Trump. I was wondering to what extent the uh, vice president or whoever he picks as vice president could play a role in attracting those elements back to him, or is that completely irrelevant and is the ticket just Trump? No, good point. Um, shall we start? Stephen, yeah, you start this time. Um, about a six year uh, proposition. Um, I think it's interesting. I think it's also very optimistic. Um, uh, frankly, with the current uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking, no, I, I was going to say, I'm not talking so much about, about, about the Senate, but still, I mean, the, the Senate, after all, is the, the, the place where in uh, both impeachment uh, cases of Donald Trump, they uh, bar one in one case and bar seven in the second uh, case, but where all the other ones uh, chose to uh, totally neglect their duty of being a jury. And, and, and totally ignored the evidence out of, out of self-interest. So, but even more so in the House of Representatives where people are actually now fighting each other physically among each other in, a, in, in, in the same party, which is what you get if you have former wrestlers who with, no, really, who, who with, with, with very, very radical talk managed to get elected, uh, where uh, all of them, the 100% fraction uh, uh, have uh, elected uh, Mike Johnson, who was the legal advisor for the legal insurrection against, against the confirmation of Biden. If you have these kind of people in Congress for one of the parties, I don't see how, I mean, it's, it's an interesting idea. Maybe it would add a little bit to the solution, but I, I, I don't see the, the magic wand there that, that, that is going to change it very easily. Uh, um, I, I don't see anything at all. Actually, when, when we, were, uh, we were having a dinner just be, be, before we came here, we were talking about the, the chances of Nikki Haley. And uh, as much as I hate uh, what Nikki Haley is, uh, is saying during the Republican debates, where it is once again uh trying to be more radical than the other one nikki haley at least strikes me as someone who uh also from past experience uh, doesn't necessarily mean all that and who might for instance when we're talking about support for the for the ukraine uh and uh international diplomacy might turn the republican party uh, a little bit more to normal and maybe the 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 example of a president who does that might in a long term, in a very long term, uh, have a certain effect on 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 uh, the people in Congress as well. But I mean, it's go it's going to take a long time <laughs> before we uh, we get to to any normalization there. Sorry in, to depress you all. Uh, independent <laughs> or third candidates were mentioned. Uh, so uh, anything on. Uh, on that category? Independent candidates. Yeah. Well, independent candidates can be important. Um, we're talking about presidential elections then, yeah, I guess, yeah. because uh, they can be important, of course, in taking away uh, votes that otherwise, if they wouldn't run, 
would go to one of the two other candidates of the major parties of the main parties uh, and uh, that's that's something that happened for instance in 2000 uh, i think I'll, if there wouldn't have been ralph nader who was running for the green party i most probably al gore would have become the president of the united states because you remember uh 2000 it's already a long time ago but it was very close and it 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 came down to Florida, who won Florida, to decide who was going to get a majority in the Electoral College, uh, Bush or Gore. They did this recounting. Have you ever seen the, uh, the, the pictures of those people rec uh, doing a recount in Florida? They would have to look at the, the ballots to see if the, what, what was the name again, the hanging chats and, anyway, uh, it was very close and if Ralph Nader, wouldn't have been a third party candidate. Most probably Al Gore would have picked the votes that Nader got and so he would have been the president of the United States in 2000. There wouldn't have been a war in Iraq, most probably. There wouldn't have been Islamic State. There wouldn't have been a great uh, wave of refugees to Europe. All the things that we most other things would have happened that we don't know about, of course, but I'm just trying to uh, make clear what the difference it can make who becomes president. Um, what For next year, there is this independent candidate, Robert Kennedy Jr. He uh, first started as a Democrat. He's the son of the former presidential candidate, Bobby Jr., uh, sorry, Bobby Kennedy, uh, who was murdered, assassinated in 68, the brother of the former president, John Kennedy, he, who was murdered as well, of course. Uh, what is it, this year? Uh, 68. 60 years, years ago. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow? Uh, you're tomorrow. gonna hear or read about it uh, tomorrow? Tomorrow, or, tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Then his brother, Bobby Kennedy, uh, was also a presidential candidate, was on the brink of getting the nomination for the Democratic Party when in June 68 he was murdered by a Palestinian man, yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, but it was also, as usual, there were a lot of conspiracy theories about it. Anyway, his son, Robert Kennedy Jr., wanted to run also, or is going to run for the elections next year, but as an independent. He started as a Democrat. He's a kind of strange kind of candidate, uh, to say the least. He's an anti-vaccine candidate. Um, he was uh, very active uh, for environmental matters, but it turns out that he also got paid a lot for it. He made a big fortune by being the lawyer or uh, getting affiliated with all kind of good causes. Anyway, he's, but he's, surprisingly, he's doing surprisingly well in the polls right now. In some polls, he even gets 20%, 18%, up to 20%. Now, I don't think that's going to last until November next year, if he's able to, to collect enough money to go through with the campaign. But let's suppose he, he does, and he can take away 10% of the votes that otherwise Trump or Biden would get, can make, it, can make a big difference. So no independent candidate will ever win the elections in the United States. You never know, but normally mm -hmm. it won't happen, but they can be important in preventing one of the other candidates to win. Thank you very much. The importance of uh, the running mate of President Trump for picking up additional votes um, uh, or additional support and, and then your own comment, <laughs> uh, Stephen. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm not so sure about the importance of the running mate of, uh, of of Donald Trump. I think it may have mattered to a certain extent in 2016 when um, it wasn't quite clear yet uh, uh, to what kind of a politician uh, the famous businessman and TV star was going to uh, to, to to amount, and so the. The idea at that time that with Mike Pence uh, as the adult in the room uh, uh, overseeing whichever would, uh, would, uh, could, could go wrong may have been uh, an idea that convinced uh, some voters. 
Um, but uh, after all, we know now very much what Donald Trump is about as a president, whether you're against him or, or in favor of him. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's not clear to me to what extent that uh, the a running mate is going to determine uh, anyone, anyone's vote in favor or, or against him at, uh, at, at, at the moment. Uh, um, but um, if yes, uh, there, there, there was at, when, <laughs> when, when you mentioned that you didn't think that uh, what uh, Joe Biden is doing uh, with the trade unions, um, there for once, we don't always have to agree about everything. There, I don't really don't agree. Uh, and, and and maybe first of all, let me, let, let me say this: I there is no there is not much uh, personal sympathy uh, from me lost uh, to, to 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 Mr. Biden, who have always uh, considered uh, a very typical old-fashioned career politician. Uh, and um, lack of charisma, lack of ideas, until. Uh, when he got elected, and I don't say necessarily he got them from himself, uh, apparently from people who know very well, he said, oh, after four years, Trump, now we just go back to uh, what we were doing before. And then people like, like Obama, for instance, who has always been frustrated by the fact that he, uh, he, he didn't do enough, he, he, he didn't use his first two years well enough, and after that he had a hostile Congress, but, 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 but Obama is one of the people who told Biden, uh, no, Joe, um, after four years m seeing the country moving to the, to the right very, very much, uh, it's pretty clear that more is, is going to have to be done for just uh, the good of the common people in this country and, and, and more radical change than what you're talking about. So maybe you should talk a little bit more with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren which Biden actually did. And he took their advice uh, with the surprising result that this uh, very, very uh, pro-center uh, career politician turned out, and it's not, not me, who, it's not I who uh, I'm inventing this on the spot, but according to uh, political historians, um, if you look at what he did uh, in... Uh, the fight against COVID, also economically, if you look at mm. what he did for climate change, if you do, do look at uh, the cancelling of student debt, a lot of things uh, that he tried to do but were blocked uh, to a certain extent by the Supreme Court. But the, the, the entire amount of things that he has done or tried to do um, is, um, is, according to, to a lot of people, is the most substantial uh, policy by a democratic president since uh, Lyndon B. Johnson in the 60s, and some even say since Roosevelt in the, in the 30s during the Great Depression. He actually did a lot. The problem is that he's a terrible communicator and that, that a lot of people uh, see the, the, the stumbling old man, uh, but, and, and which, which is actually something I think is eventually, but I mean, this is not a prediction. It would be foolish to predict anything. But when when I'm pressed to to say what I think is going to happen next year, even even if uh, Trump is ahead in the polls at the moment, but the combination of the of the of all the trials on uh, on on one hand, and on the other hand, Biden himself, who may be a little bit too frail and not good enough a communicator to tell this all, but all the other people, including the, the, the Bernie Sanders uh, of this world, who, who are all together going to really start campaigning and pointing out what exactly the difference is between having Trump for a president or Biden for a president, I think that could very well make the difference. Well, thank you so much. I mean, um, uh, I'm afraid I have to conclude, but... Um well, not, not giving conclusions, but uh, uh, thanking uh, the members of the panel. And I hope you will join me in a, in a round of applause for the performance of our three panelists, uh, Berthe Vru, Stephen Defour, and Professor Jean-Christophe Lefrenier. So thank you so much. I would also like to thank you um, for your participation.
Um, I'm afraid we will have to convene soon again because there's a lot left for, to discuss. And maybe at the next occasion, we should have a panel with American journalists on the next European elections. Um, so I thank you also our great team, uh, our great team of the America Europe Fund and the uh, America Europe Youth Forum uh, for assisting today. Please do support, please do follow uh, the America Europe Fund, uh, our website, look at events, next upcoming events, reports. Can I ask still your attention um, uh, for an event that uh, I continue to strongly uh, recommend on, um, which is next Wednesday, the 29th of November, uh, seven o'clock in the evening, uh, Finnish American uh, professor Anu Bradford, uh, uh, who is delivering uh, a talk on digital empires, uh, the global battle to regulate technology, so the title of our newest, uh, most recent book, so this event will take place in the auditorium uh, Zeger van Hey in the law faculty. So 29th of November, 7 p.m. I strongly uh, recommend it. And now, last but not least, I invite you to the reception downstairs in this building. Thank you so much. And uh, to the students of EU-US relations, don't forget to sign the sheet. It's over there, and then you can go enjoy the reception. Yes.